Hello from Denver and all over the world. Welcome to the Clinic for Open Source Connectors. My name is Lale Mehran. I'm the Associate Director of the Clinic for Open Source Arts and a Professor and Director of Emergent Digital Practices at the University of Denver. The Clinic for Open Source Arts explores, supports, and celebrates local and global efforts to make free and open source tools that allow people to create with digital technologies. Such tools allow anyone with access to a computer to begin creating. COSA wants to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to contribute and will especially focus on bringing together people from underrepresented communities as contributors to the ongoing innovation and growth of these tools. So COSA Arts is uh, funded in part by the Knight Foundation and supported by the Emergent Digital Practices Program and the Madden Center, uh, both at the University of Denver. Chris Coleman is the founder of COSA and the executive producer for the COSA Connector series. So we are um, absolutely delighted, excited to launch the COSA Connectors, uh, premiering here at Ars Electronica 2020. Um, we'll be exploring and showcasing the many free Libre open source tools, or we can call them floss, used by artists and other creatives. Each of these two to three minute videos, it takes a quick look at a tool, sharing what it can do, and talking about who might find it useful. The particular tools are curated and toured by a group of amazing contributors uh, or people, um, and we're calling them our uh, basically connectors, as you can see on screen, working in the digital field, and they span many different practices. The goal is to help people find uh, mostly underutilized tools, and give anyone with a computer, the internet and the internet, new ways to express themselves at no cost. So with our amazing connectors coming from multiple age groups, gender, sexual identities and racial backgrounds, we will forefront these tools to be for everyone. So uh, again, launching COSA connectors, we have Aaron Davey, Everest Pipkin and Shawnee um, McLean Holloway. So uh, I don't know if we can do the, <laughs> emojis. <laughs> um, so I will pass on and uh, ask each one to please introduce themselves. Um, if we may start with Everest, please. Hi, um, I'm Everest Pipkin. I'm talking to you from Central Texas. Uh, I'm an artist and developer. I work with creative code and creative code technologies um, in my practice as in my teaching practice. Um, these are you know, things that are really important to me that are, I think tool making is uh, an exciting way to kind of create technologies that share and um, allow others to also create. And I was so excited to be invited to uh, pick some tools to share with everyone as well as have a conversation about them. Um, thank, thank you. Erin, <laughs> if we may uh, learn a little bit about you. Yeah, okay, so I'm Erin Davey, and um, right now I'm kind of in the middle of taking a hiatus of my degree at Carnegie Mellon for computer science and fine arts. Um, I do a lot of generative things, uh, definitely a lot of generative images, but I'm trying to go ahead and make them um, on print soon, so I'm excited for that. I yeah, I really enjoy hexagons, the shape. And I also have a Twitch um, account called Cozy Coding, where I do a lot of creative coding streams. I focus a lot on P5.js, but currently I'm taking a bit of a break to focus on a couple of different tools besides that. Um, yeah, so I usually do them on Tuesdays afternoons in EST, Thursdays afternoons and Saturday evenings, but not this Saturday as I have this. <laughs> but yeah, that's all about me. Wonderful, thank you. And Shawnee, can you share a bit about yourself, please? Yeah, sure. I'm Shawnee Michaelene Holloway, and I'm in Chicago right now. Um, I am a teacher at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, as well as the University of Illinois in Chicago, and I teach creative coding um, and <laughs> at risk of being too general, just like computers <laughs> to many different kinds of artists. Um, my main kind of um, student is, is, a, is our journalist, which I, I find really cool. Um, though I'm a new media artist is how I describe myself. And that really means for me, at least um, using technologies that 
communicate um, the most sort of efficiently and meaningfully in that moment. Um, so that means anything, <laughs> which is exciting. Um, but I that means I also make uh, performance and sculpture and, and um, yeah, anything that has to do with networks and systems is sort of by the name of the game for me. Um, and I am a poet. I have written a few books and I make electronic music. And yeah, I, I like to play video games. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to just do a couple more highlights um, since clearly um, uh, our COSA connectors are uh, not only generous, but they're also, like, um, I, I would say, um, being modest. So just, just skimming the top of this very quickly, um, Everest has uh, is an incredible contributor, has amazing, thoughtful work. Um, and again, just skimming the top, um, everything from international exhibits, uh, from uh, the Somerset House London, uh, Melbourne uh, Career Game Festival, um, and uh, my, uh, she has a fabulous um, project. Uh, they have a fabulous project, MIT Cambridge, Bitforms in New York, um, the residencies at Mass Mocha, Media Archaeology Lab. Um, it, the 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 um, the CV is is rather impressive, and I would just say that um, their again modesty and generosity um, certainly matches their CV. So it's it's ample. Um, I'll let you check it out. Um, and then uh, Aaron also being um, modest uh, in that they were a 2020. Uh, Processing Fellow. Um, also, uh, she is a, a P5JS contributor, um, as you will see in, in one of the amazing uh, videos. So, and I am, we've had this conversation. I am also a huge fan of the hexagons. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then uh, just going down uh, my, my uh, list here. Uh, and then Shane also being um, extremely modest. Um, with having uh, international exhibitions, including at the New Museum in New York, the Kitchen, uh, Institute of Contemporary Arts London, Museum of Contemporary Arts Chicago, um, and uh, again, many, many more things. Um, so I encourage you to, to check out their uh, individual works as well. So um, I am going to, again, I have many questions, but I'm gonna pause for a second um, and uh, see if you have any questions for each other, um, attempting to have an organic dialogue in a format that doesn't necessarily facilitate that. So I'll pause for a second um, and then I'm happy to jump in with my first question. Yeah, um, one thing I was excited to ask um, Everest in regards to Neo Cities, because I actually haven't heard of it until you started talking about it. And I did like some research and saw that it was basically just free web hosting or like rather cheap web hosting if you um, if you decide to be a supporter. So I was wondering if you can if you have some information how flexible Neo Cities is because I've been looking for a web host um, a web hosting service for my own website and I just want to know if we can handle like different frameworks besides just basic like HTML, CSS, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Neo Cities. I think it's great. Um, as far as I can tell, the the free tier you get a limited sort of subset of um, file types. So you, which includes HTML, CSS, JavaScript, sort of all the standards. Um, I don't think you can upload videos on their service uh, unless you sign on for the five dollars a month hosting, um, which is still really cheap for web hosting. I am considering moving my own site to my portfolio site to NeoCities. It's currently on GitHub, which I have mixed feelings about, um, mostly bad feelings about if I'm being honest. Although I think there is an accessibility thing about GitHub, which is great. Uh, things are discoverable there. Um, but New Cities, New Cities is similar in that way and that there is actually a little bit of a social element that you can opt into or opt out of depending on how you want to use it, which allows your site to be discoverable, not just as a web host, but also as sort of a platform of expression that's like tied to a username and other users in New Cities so can sort of comment. And so it has a little bit of like a built, built in web rings like forum vibe to it which i miss a lot about kind of the handmade web and um handmade hosting sites so yeah to answer your question i it feels fully capable of hosting like a standard artist's portfolio i know that they have an api um 
if you're used to pushing changes through, you know, uh, your terminal or your console. Um, but I have not used that. I've only used the web interface, which is also like totally friendly. Um, it's a nice kind of, <sighs> so many domain hosts make it so unnecessarily complicated and it's lovely just to kind of like deal with a simple interface that does exactly what it says on the surface and you can upload files and edit them directly in the browser or download them and upload them. It makes it all pretty simple. I don't know. I think it's great. <laughs> it's a great site. I'll let you know how moving my own stuff there goes. Yeah, thanks. Um, especially because I saw the appeal of it where it's just, I really do miss the decentralized internet, even though I wasn't really young enough to appreciate it. I was like on the cusp end of it, you know, um, when I started to use the internet. So I do miss like the fact that it seemed as if you were forging your own path, you know, it seems as if you were out and discovering all these weird little nuanced websites without having these big domains, these big, big like uh, companies that like take control of it, you know, so it's really great um, that, that uh, web hosting. And I'm really excited to use it, especially because like the, um, the paid, ser the paid uh, service is only $5 a month, which is like a steal <laughs> so yeah and i even even like even the fight besides the fact that it's like very cheap i just it's something that i would like to support yeah i think one of the better things even if you like aren't gonna move your entire if somebody's watching this is like i'm not gonna move my entire hosting to a new site um one of the best things about new cities is just going to the main page and seeing the sites that have opted into being public and you can sort them by the last time they've been updated so you can see a bunch of people that have just made like little small changes to their handmade website um, in real time, right? And these things happen. Somebody's updating the website all the time. So there'll be a change from a minute ago, a change from three minutes ago. And it feels a little bit like an RSS feed combo, social media combo GeoCities. And um, it and it's, it's so accessible, uh, which is, I think, a, a theme of so many of the tools that I'll three of us kind of picked up, um, which are, you know, tools that are open source, um, tools that are kind of looking at a different way, maybe the internet could function or did function and could function in the future, but aren't going to sort of keep people out of them um, because they have really difficult interfaces, uh, which is, I think, it seems like is a thematic, um, link between everything that we picked. That, that perfectly segues into my first question. Um, I really appreciated the um, span of uh, tools that you all picked. And um, also, uh, as, as you're speaking, I was about the accessibility, right? The kind of e easing into some of the uses. And they do ramp into some of the ones, um, for example, that Aaron was sharing that are quite sophisticated and complicated. Um, and, and they're they're uh, they're not apologetic about it and they're very upfront. And I, and I do appreciate that. It's not like, oh, this will be easy. And then you're like, well, I, you know, uh, only if you know C++, right? <laughs> so I, I think, um, so what, one of my questions was, as I was watching all the videos and really enthralled, and I was not aware of many of these tools and getting like so excited, like, oh, like, are you kidding me? This is amazing, um, was um, for, for um, basically the connector showcases, how did you all narrow down to uh, just the few? Because uh, yeah, there's so many um, to choose from. So that's my first question: is how did you select um, to showcase the particular ones that you did for Cosa Connectors? Uh, feel free to jump in. I don't, <laughs> whatever order you, you would care to go into. I mean, I think I had that same question um, both for Everest and Aaron because, you know, I think my selection was. Uh, some some of them are old, a little bit older projects, um, and a lot of these projects I have been introduced to like as a student many many years ago, and then I just sort of kept using them, and and I think that they've become a big part of my workflow for that reason, but also because I'm not sure that I know how to f like also find a, t a ton of them, and that was going to be sort of one of my question for you too is like how you know once you get involved with one project does it go kind of beyond that. Um, and I'm really excited to sort of be in this community now of folks that are thinking more about 
how to <laughs> also connect open source projects. Um, but the, uh, you know, the reason why I, I think I picked um, Twine, for example, was because it's so embedded within communities um, that I feel also a part of. Not only is it embedded in like a writing community, but it's also embedded in a computers community and it's also embedded in um, an educational community. And to be able to have all of those things happen at once and also be able to like put my own content into this system that's being sort of mediated by all these different fields um, and have it be understood by all three of them in at least one way <laughs> was was really, really nice. Um, but you know, as I as I watch um, all of these and the span of them, um, it got me so excited to think about how you know these videos will hopefully find other people like like me um, that yeah don't, might not know how to find these things outside of yeah like maybe that some of the bigger the bigger projects. That that's definitely one of my other questions, right? in the sea of search engines and algorithms, how does one, yeah, figure that out? But I, yeah, so I know I'm jumping like to like question number 35, you know? Um, so I'll, I, I shall pause and uh, love to hear, um, yeah, how uh, Everest and Aaron, um, yeah, narrowed down their selection. Um, well, for me, um, what I did is I I took the Twitter and I said on Twitter is like, hey, does anyone know any like open source like um, frameworks? So I had some idea of what to do, but I felt as if I wanted to have a bit more diversity in the tools I showcased. And I also would, I thought it'd be cool if I like found some new tools for like me to work with. And you know, people like posted stuff on Twitter, and I kind of just uh, took all those responses then to that tweet. And I like, put it on a like Kanban board and I would just like go through um, each and every single one and say like, is this cool to like feature? Is this something unique I haven't seen? And I saw some really cool stuff too. Like um, one of the, one of the frameworks I didn't feature because I thought it was, uh, I thought it'd be a bit too like nuanced, not necessarily fitting the whole theme of closed connectors was this like Ouroboros program, which would basically translate, it had the ability to translate programs from one language to like the next. And there's like 120 different languages it would be able to translate to and then like back to itself. And I'm just like, this is cool. And I think it's fascinating but it doesn't fit the theme and I have no use for it right now. <laughs> so I didn't mention it, but just some of the cool things that I found there. And then after that, I um, picked like the uh, five biggest, or so, so like five, four biggest frameworks that I thought would uh, be able to fit its own video and have a lot of substantial uh, things. Like I wanted to have something that was very open-ended for people to use so that they can create a lot of different things with it. And then after that, at the very end for my last one, I. I definitely had a hard time picking and choosing because my last video is like a honorable mentions <laughs> video, which is like something that I found was like super cool, but I didn't have time to put it into its own video and I thought it wouldn't be enough, um, like enough material to do it. So for my last one, it's just the whole like block of things that I found was like really awesome and stuff like that. Uh, even still, like I'm looking at my like list that I had and it's just, I had like probably like 15 or so that I got from my own experience and from like Twitter, because I, I know that I, in regards to creative coding and just, um, you know, gen of art, I kind of live in a bit of a bubble where I use like the same tools over and over again. I'm kind of getting tired of it. So I didn't really have that knowledge in myself. I just had to go out and ask people and ask the community and find things through word of mouth. I really appreciate the kind of um, openness of, of, I would be like scared to ask that question. and. I love how like you so systematically like researched it. You were like, okay, democracy, tell me what you want. And then you're like, I'm gonna research each one of these. Um, I think there's something really, again, in the spirit of, of right, of, of having this kind of community and wanting the input of even like, what would you like me to kind of uh, talk about? So I, I really appreciate your whole kind of process and synthesis of that. And I'm also really, uh, again, impressed that you were like, okay, bring it <laughs> and, um, going through that. So now, of course, I'm curious to see the full list of, and, and see like, yeah, what else is on there. And um, I think there, there's something really critical and, and, you know, 
again, one of my other questions has to do with education and the things we learn and pass on and, and uh, how we kind of um, both, you know, really appreciate those tools that are still strong, but also expand um, kind of our uh, ability to, to use new ones or embrace new ones or contribute to new ones. Um, so uh, that, that's, yeah, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Everest, if you could kindly let us know how you were able to narrow down. Um, and I, yeah, I really uh, loved, I, I didn't know so many of them. I was like, what? Like, yeah, I'm a complete um, kind of sticky post-it <laughs> fan. So just all of that was, was really quite fascinating. Yeah, um, I think I picked tools along a particular uh, axis of computing, which is sort of minimal but web-based computation. Um, and they don't all exactly fit into that space, but most of them are programmed in JavaScript. Most of them run in the browser. Um, most of them have very human readable code. So you can go to the GitHub or wherever they're hosted or just open the view source in the browser and actually read how they're written. It's not sort of machine generated JavaScript. And most of them are trying to run or create sort of finished products at a very low um, file size. Uh, that require sort of a minimum of energy and a low hardware bracket to run online. Uh, these are, there are so many interesting tools that fall outside of those categories. Um, I taught a class in the spring that was focused on sort of open source and experimental tools. So I feel like I've been in tool zone in my brain for months and months and months. Um, but it was useful to kind of look at all of those conversations we had around tools, around open source tools, around what a tool is, what a tool can be, um, and kind of distill not just like this amazing ecosystem of tools, but also like a tool that filled in this really particular slot that I'm interested in, which is the potential of the internet, the potential of the web and things happening on the browser, but not necessarily online, not connected to the internet at this particular moment. These tools are things that can run in a website and a web page, but whether you are or not like directly connect, talking to a server, um, these are things that can happen in the space of the internet, but kind of on a phone or on, you know, an older laptop or on a fancy desktop computer. And that sort of um, the possibility of the internet as a space that uh, is asynchronous, uh, that doesn't require like constant um, communication with a server somewhere to work, that doesn't require a big fancy like hardware suite um, to function, were, were all things that were exciting to me and kind of helped me in selecting those tools. I really appreciate the the kind of parameters, right? Of like again, it's it's the options are so intense, but the the way that you're kind of processing and, and making decisions on these, and um, I think one of the things that I really appreciated um, in your choice selection had to do with uh, elegance. Uh, the kind of um, decision making that had to, um, it seems simple, but you actually have to work sometimes harder when you have to um, make something that's small or contained, or you don't have as many options. And so like Strike and Bitsy, I thought were really beautiful ways. Um, you, you talked about them as possibly prototyping, but also how the limitations really push um, kind of uh, more possibilities sometimes. So I, I, I think like there's something really interesting about that. And I believe Shana, you also were talking about file sizes at one point, right? Like how does one deal with that? And, um, you know, as folks who um, sometimes <laughs> are way too often work with like 4K video, you're like, I don't know how many more hard drives <laughs> I can, uh, you know, deal with right now. Um, so I think there's something, uh, again, the span of all of these um, programs and projects uh, are tools that can be multifaceted and used for different um, depths and layers of different kinds of projects. Like uh, I, I feel like at least you know a dozen of these could be used for the same project for different kinds of um, thinking and managing and communication and uh, brainstorming, prototyping, like all of that. So uh, yeah, I, I do find them really exciting and. Um, I'm deeply appreciative that everyone has shared these because, uh, again, some of them I wasn't familiar with and definitely going to go um, check them out. So, um, uh, again, trying trying to be fluid with our conversation, I want to go back to um, 
like what Shane was uh, kind of also asking, right? Which is like, um, you know, in this massive pool of how, how do you select? How do you choose, right? Um, and and I and I loved how Aaron was like, yeah, like I, I, I asked, you know, my, my Twitter people, like, hey, help me try to narrow this down. So um, I think like, those are some of the questions, like, how does one, you know, again, like find the tools and then um, to dovetail onto that is how do you select, right? So like you, you found a tool, but then um, who's making it? Um, as an artist, you're paying attention to the kind of community that that tool comes from. Um, and sometimes you want to know if the tool is on its way out. Like how much commitment are you going to have to a piece of software, um, you know, a tool that uh, you may not be able to support. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's, it's something new. So um, if, if you all could share your kind of um, thoughts on that or your processes and uh, help us <laughs> understand how to narrow down and kind of select, that would be awesome. Thank you. I think a lot of times aesthetic also comes into that. Um, and, you know, especially when you're entrenched in any sort of like DIY community, which is presumably some of the folks that are using these tools, um, I think that you kind of get embedded in kind of a certain step, you know, and I think PD, for example, really brings a particular aesthetic to the work. Um, and in some ways also P5 does too. I mean, it's, I think that P5 is very expansive, but when you're first starting out, um, I feel like it's a bunch of like spinning squares and um, like little circles and things and nice noises. And um, it feels sometimes really good to be a part of that phenomena and maybe PD, pure data is like a part of one of these tools that might be on its way out. Cause if you, if you Google like any of the documentation, you're going to find like patches from like 2000, you know, and you open them and they're, they just go <laughs> like, this. that's it. That's all you have. <laughs> um, but you know, um, even that in itself, like the recreating and the kind of like resurrecting of an aesthetic, a sound aesthetic or a visual aesthetic that was, I think is really exciting. Um, and, you know, as I went through some of these, like my light research, um, because I just want to be like, oh my gosh, am I know, do I know what I'm talking about? Which is also really exciting about these open source tools because you never know like what's going to change or, um, you know, I, I learned that, um, there were many builds of pure data sort of <laughs> like floating around out there that can do this better, that better. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's just, it's exciting to feel a kind of spirit. And I think for, for me, at least um, p5.js has that spirit for me. Um, and maybe for me, because I don't work in it a whole ton, whole ton, um, that's like the way the community works and how they come together and have conversations. Um, yeah, and I think that just expands kind of beyond that because when you feel a warmth, maybe you want to go towards it. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree with that. I feel like for me, the number one way to find a tool is to find a thing that was made in the tool and love it. Um, that is often how I discover things is go like, oh, what is this? How was it made? Like, what was it made in? And then go and sort of look that up and realize it is partly due to or responding to um, the aesthetic space or um, the restrictions of the tool that it was made in, which are often quite generative um, for me. It's, I think, also why I picked all these tools that do exactly one little kind of minimal thing and you're, you're working within the constraints of that program because those constraints often push you in ways that you wouldn't necessarily push yourself or wouldn't even think about being pushed. Um, and I think those tools are some of the most exciting ones to me. And they're some of the ones that make the strongest communities because they inherently have a little bit of aesthetic or cohesive glue um, that the people who are drawn to those tools are drawn to them for a reason. And it's because the tool lends them a particular strength. And then, you know, you get communities of people who are interested in exploring that space, um, which I, I think can be really exciting. Um, community moderation is a whole other uh, <laughs> deal and um, is certainly its own um, 
end in pursuit, you know, not every tool has a healthy community, but I think a lot of the tools that we picked do. And it's always exciting to sort of like go to a forum, go to a discord, like get into a part of that conversation and find that this thing that you are um, drawn to because you saw something that was made in it because you like it's, it's aesthetic possibility also has a group of people who are interested in making with it and will talk with you about both the technical and sort of aspirational um, ways, ways to do that thing. And I think it's worth mentioning that p5.js has brought all of us together in one way or another. <laughs> and we maybe we wouldn't have met in person without that project. <laughs> this <Yeah>. is true. <laughs> yeah. We were all at true. the contributors conference, which I find to be like very great because I met a lot of people there. And I think like going to the contributors conference conference was um, basically how I entered like the um, community of creative coding because I've always like did it but it was in a uh, scholastic setting you know so um, going ahead and uh, seeing that like this tool that I use in scholastic setting is constantly being used by people out there for their own like work was like pretty refreshing because at before and at the time I've always viewed p5.js as like the tool that you use um, as an entry to creative coding and then eventually you like let go of it <laughs> you know like you move on to like bigger and better things and and um, I always like had a bit of a like kind of hiccup with myself because I really like using P5GS and processing and I like want to hold fast to those like tools I learned when I was younger because there's just so many things that you can do with it, you know, so seeing people that um, use it in their um, work today, you know, and they haven't like grown past it was really refreshing as well. Yeah, and I think like it's worth mentioning, you know, in the in the end of the video about P5, I was like, look, like P5 lives here, but also things like the only project that's coming to mind right now is just P P5 Live um, by Ted Davis. And I'm like, this library, you know, I, I think it's interesting and awesome that you're talking about this thing of like, oh, it's sort of it's just transition space or something, um, but it does live its life sort of in other ways. And I think Lale, you mentioned this earlier, like how do these tools maybe become training grounds for your you to sort of go on and yeah, like be more fluent in other environments. And I think definitely um, you're right about how P5 does that, Aaron, for sure. Um, I was like, man, you, you all are like the best. So this totally dovetails into my next question, which has to do with learning and education, right? So um, how do you think that our field has changed with the proliferation of these free online tools and resources? Uh, and I want to say for learning, so um, both in the kind of academy, but as one leaves it as well. So um, just kind of uh, yeah, where are your thoughts on that? And and because um, it has, it's made a huge impression on all of us, um, as I think most of us learned it probably, you know, in a class. And then uh, it's it's definitely stuck. Um, I know for me, at least, because I'm pretty young, like I'm 22 and I'm still within like the college age and still going through college. So speaking from like a student's experience, there's like a bit of like the notorious jump between um, processing and open frameworks. And <laughs> like um, for processing is like rather friendly and it's kind of just like, um, I don't want to say it teaches you how to code, but it definitely, te it definitely teaches you the um, uh, tenets of creative coding. But then like open frameworks, it's just kind of like a truck. And it's just, um, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't really, it's not really grateful. <laughs> it's not really generous with how it does, how it like um, teaches you how to use its framework. And especially going from Java to like C++ is difficult, you know, and it just, it's a huge jump, you know, and not a lot of people are willing to make that jump. But the people who do are just kind of like, they're struggling along the way. So definitely um, the release of these, like a lot of different tools and stuff has made the jump way easier to do because there's stepping stones. Like one of the libraries that I talked about was Open Renderer and Open Renderer came out about like two years ago and they are like strictly marketing themselves as like a motor ground between processing and open frameworks. Like in their Q and A, they say, how's it different than processing and how's it different from open frameworks, you know? So um, just with that, um, it makes it easier for people to go ahead and like um, 
expand their uh, creative processes by using tools that allow you to do more, you know, that allow you like access to your own like hardware and like have you talk to different sorts of tools and systems via OSC and things like that. So that's what I really like about this whole like rise in proliferation because it just makes it easier for you to explore. You don't have to worry too much about the giant barriers to entry. Yeah. Um, stop teaching Adobe challenge 2021, I, I, in my opinion. Um, I am so excited about this proliferation of open source tools. It's really changed actually since I was a student and now as I am sort of in and out of teaching positions um, where you don't actually have to maybe totally align to the big proprietary software. Um, it can still be useful, students still, um, you know, sometimes need to get a job and the job uh, comes with the software and all of that stuff is real. Uh, but for students and humans uh, who don't necessarily, aren't able to furnish the hundreds of dollars a month that it would take to be a subscribing um, service member of the full Adobe suite or any other sort of big proprietary software, uh, having open source alternatives is just so fundamentally useful. Um, I am so excited about projects and processes that manage to sort of, we talked about this briefly for a, a moment, like string together these little pieces of lots of different projects, um, you know, do a title illustration here, do some writing here, do some brainstorming here, like plug it all into this engine and end up with something that looks wholly unique and exists entirely outside of like a proprietary software system. That is so exciting to me. That is like, oh, maybe there actually has been some progress here. Um, because I am um, really, I, I think it's a, it's a tragedy when you get stuck inside of a big system that does it all, but costs you um, often beyond what you can afford, either in labor or in money, uh, just to make things. Like that is such a high barrier for entry, um, especially for people straight out of school who are like moving from, okay, my school pays for my subscription with a, you know, part of my, you know, educational fee goes into this thing into like, oh, not only do I have student debt, I can't afford to use any of the software that I've learned the past four years. It's a, it's a brutal thing. So if you are an educator, I would highly encourage you to think about um, the ways in which that can kind of slot into or replace um, aspects of kind of the proprietary software ecosystem that I think has been standardized in education for a long time. Definitely. Um, and as a person who comes from those structures that is now not a student anymore, uh, but is a teacher and sort of had to become a teacher in some ways in order to continue the, the stuff, right? I mean, I think that that's really very real. Um, I, you know, some of us who are teachers also battle things like students who might not have um, computers that like run a whole ton. Like maybe we're like talking about folks who like run things on Chrome, Chromebooks and need these kinds of I mean, even past the sort of financial aspect of it, but just like need a different set of tools to be able to accomplish like basic stuff. Um, you know, even if that's like making a sort of a composite picture collage or something that like sometimes these Chromebooks or things of the similar things just like cannot handle. And I think that that's one thing that I always try to be really mindful of, especially in my creative coding courses, um, because I do go, I, I teach a multi-level creative coding course. So there's, I'm half of my class is computer science seniors. And the other half is like, how do I install an application? And I'm like, great, y'all people can get together, we'll work together. Um, but ultimately every semester there comes up of like, ugh, my, my computer just won't run this. And so I've just stopped teaching anything that requires any any like super crazy graphics pro processing, stuff like this. Um, and so I think that a lot of the, these selections um, have given me even more material to like, yeah, just like pull from. Um, and I really appreciate that a lot. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think, yeah, there's lots of complexities of sustainability 
um, coming up. Um, we have a, uh, a viewer who is um, also talking about on the flip side, right? One of the curses of, of being in new media for a long time is what happens when the tool that you've been invested in for such a long time uh, becomes obsolete, uh, whether it's director, flash, Java, applets or open frameworks. Um, and I think like potentially some of the things that that um, you all are exploring, right, which is kind of like the diversity of the tools, you know, potentially allows for um, the, the ability not to uh, really have this kind of crash, right, the sunsetting of um, such powerful tools. Um, and then what does one do after they've left? What, what happens to your projects, right? So it becomes like this crazy sustainability archiving issue. Um, and it is, it's, it's really complicated. And, and I think it's, it's a important conversation to have when we're talking about open source tools. Um, how, what is the life of it? Do we understand um, what this means, right? As far as like your investment, your commitment to it, how, how far you know, do you go into the deep end of the pool, um, especially, you know, when you're talking about things that you, you become really enamored with and, and you're like, oh, this, this tool was made for me. This is amazing. Um, we don't have much time uh, left. So uh, I'm, I'm going to um, open the floor to, to you all if you have questions for each other. I uh, want to make sure you have that opportunity. If not, I do, I do have um, one more, well, many more questions, but I do have a last question. So I, sh I shall open the floor for, for you all first. I wanna respond really quick to what you were saying. The thing, the first thing that came to mind was, um, and y'all people gotta let me know if this is for real true or not, but uh, the story was, is that Jody had this garden project and this garden project was like made in whatever year and fast forward 15 years later, they tried to install it in this other museum and it, it ran in like two seconds because whatever the sort of <laughs> software reader was, was like very new. And um, they, whoever it was um, had to like throw a bunch of garble into the compiler in order to make like a new version of that program. <laughs> And I just, I love this idea, um, both that like, who, you know, whoever made this gar garden program, if it even existed, like, uh, you know, was able to kind of keep and shepherd that project. And I'm assuming it was just like kind of a bunch of files full of code, perhaps, but like, you know, I don't, I don't know what was involved, but that, and then also that you could kind of, again, like resurrect certain things by adding like new elements and new kinds of peripherals. And um, I'm very much of the school of like, you know, most of the work that I've done lives on a broken hard drive and whatever, if it's on the internet, you can have it, it's there, but like, let it, like, let it die. Um, and so I, I would actually be really curious about y'all's perspective on this because I really while the archive is so important to me intellectually the physical manifestations of those things like are not and yet I'm just curious about how you see that sustainability element um uh to add to the complications of this uh we have someone asking um from the chat uh a very complicated and good question, which is where do you draw the line with programs made by problematic people or companies? Um, and I think, you know, uh, Everest, you were certainly, um, I think, addressing some of some of this, right? Uh, maybe not specifically as like problematic people or companies, but maybe the, the ecosystem itself. Um, but if, if, um, if you could uh, please incorporate this in your response as well. <laughs> I'm going to start on the sort of sunsetting abandonware software question. And if I come up with a way to incorporate, I might pivot, um, but we might have to loop back to that. Um, but uh, yes, to your point about sort of um, running old projects and, you know, seeing the ways in which computation has changed um, their capacity to run because of, you know, failure to archive this or that, or also just because like compilers have changed. I think all of that's very real. Uh, I, the debt loss of Flash this year, although semi understandable was a real tragedy um, for kind of that explosion of early creativity and games on the web. I mean, there are Flash games that are every, every bit as remarkable as games that are coming out now that unless they've been archived, which they are being lovingly archived, um, for the most part aren't accessible in their original format anymore. All of that's true. 
Uh, this happens both with open source frameworks and with corporate frameworks. Uh, but the difference between an open source thing is that there it's much, much easier to reverse engineer than something that has been specifically sunsetted and abandoned and locked down um, by a corporate agency. And we do see that type of thing. I, I currently worry, although I use Unity in my work, I think Unity is an interesting program. It is free, which is um, di different <laughs> than many things like it. It is also closed source. and um, when it exports, you know, a, a file, you you can't modify it. You don't have any way to sort of access it, and that potentially is a you know a, a scale of loss that's similar to Flash, um, if not more so, coming in the future. I also think there's some something to be said for you know I've talked about the web, talked about JavaScript, talked about human readable script. Um, all of that is worth thinking about. It's something I'm thinking about a lot right now in my own work is like my role as an artist in tech, tech accelerationism. You know, I make shiny, pretty things that I want people to run on their computers and therefore they have to have a computer that can run my work. And that is tr troubled, right? And I'm, I'm trying to unpack that relationship that I have not necessarily with the computers and the hardware that I use, but also with the hardware that I ask others to produce in, you know, in their own lives. Um, and I, at the end of the day, I'm not, <laughs> not convinced that anything that I've made that requires like hardware acceleration is any better than anything I've made that's actually just a plain text file. And um, I'm, I'm trying to unpack that in my future and see if I, I can get back there. Uh, yeah, that didn't address healthy community moderation at all either, although that's its own topic. Maybe we could go, <laughs> go down that road. That'll be our next COSA connector series. Erin, what, what do you think? I mean, I think, you know, one of the, the really uh, fascinating positions is um, how you all are, you know, in kind of different, um, you know, you're in the same field, but in kind of different placements and, and approaching things differently. And I think, you know, you, you still being a student, uh, you know, I think it's, it's pretty fascinating to see what this means for you and the decisions you're making versus what's being made for you, you know, kind of in class. So what are your thoughts on, on this um, huge question? Well, I, in regards to the obsolescence of tools, I feel absolutely cheated, um, especially because like, I didn't really go through, um, I didn't really like when I was like, when I was experiencing the internet when I was younger, I didn't really go through the phase of like experiencing flash games. So it was kind of like, um, when my friends would tell me about it when I was older, I would go ahead and like, look, you know, and uh, I could see why they treasure these games. So like to see that like people are like phasing, like Flash is being phased out and it just really pisses me off, <laughs> especially because like um, a lot of the old internet is based on Flash and there's like a lot of very different like old like websites and like old applications, you know, and there's like, isn't really a good way to preserve these old applications. Um, I really like looking back at like old hardware and software, like one of my favorite things is old video games. Um, so um, when it's like kind of hard to like find these like video games, physical copies, like getting like the ROMs, you know, and just like, Cata like cataloging them and creating them has always been like a little bit of passion of mine. I've known if I like had like more money and more hard drives would definitely be like a data hoarder where I would just be like saving and just like storing all these like old, um, all these old files and these old tech because it's just really nice to create these because once they're gone, it's like they're like completely lost within like the sea of information. It's so hard to find them, you know. So I feel like very disappointed that that's like phasing out and like time and time again, especially recently, I see a lot of different um, features being discontinued for like the sake of like monetary gain. Like uh, the most recent thing that I'm really annoyed about is um, YouTube's decision to disable community contributions, which if you don't know, community contributions is basically just um, when viewers would go ahead and translate um, creators' videos into their own language. You know, so like if it happens to be like a video in like Spanish or like Portuguese or Japanese, and uh, if someone happens to be bilingual and wants to translate that video, they can go ahead and do it. And it's really great because it opens like the community to different languages as language is clearly a big barrier. But YouTube's like, nope, not a lot of people use it, which doesn't really make sense as there's a lot of different users on YouTube. And uh, if it's a small percentage, it's still a very substantial amount, you know, and it doesn't harm them to keep it around. So the fact that they're taking that away is like really disappointing in my opinion. And I just happen to like see that a lot. Um, so yeah, from that, I feel very, really cheated about it as well. 
Um, I know there's a second part to this question and I'm trying to see like, where do you draw the line with programs, either problematic people or companies? Um, for me there, I uh, have like a huge stance on separating the like art from the artist. Um, but like, if I have to pay for it and I do not want to give money to this like corporation, I try to find an alternative or I would like use someone who's already paid for it, like use someone's copy who's already paid for it. Yeah, you know, um, that's basically what I do about it. I, I'm very glad for open source as well. So in regards to that aspect, I don't feel as cheated because there's just a whole like flowing with the different resources and libraries to use that are very similar to these tools that are made by pragmatic people and companies. Um, and I hope it just continues to flourish as well. And I hope that like people continue to like realize how important open source is because I know some like companies are like, oh, open source is bad because that means you can't like, um, you can't really critique how uh, good the code is if everyone's going ahead and coding for it. There's no standard and therefore it's going to be bad, but like, you know, the community would moderate themselves. The community will know what's good or not. And since everyone in the community is invested in this tool, though, the community will make sure that the tool is pristine and the people who are writing code for it are um, valuable contributors and qualified for it. Such a mirror to the rest of the world, I feel like it's like just the community will will do it when it needs to and has to and has a use for that thing. And, you know, just speaking of communities and, and, and networks and how they change and grow and also about being pissed off that you can't see these tools. I, I get that because one of my dear, dear friends, Paul Hertz, um, who is a generative code artist, um, is always kind of reminding me that macro media or macro media director or mac, uh, adult, uh, macro media director i think i see this is i'm so, so young i don't even know what the software is called but this community is um the the folks that were really in, heavily involved with that community are, are still talking and still have these listservs and you know I, I think it's interesting how when this when a software dies too it starts sort of morphing and changing and um the relationship might change but also the community might not. And I think that that just speaks so much to what you're saying, Erin. Um, and one of the, you know, and to sort of also like speak back to the ways that companies can kind of see these open source things is I'm um, really fascinated with open source hardware. I like have no, I mean, I <laughs> went to an entire conference this year, you know, thanks to the open source hardware summit for, you know, making me their auto lovelace fellow this year, but I watched and I was just so taken by also the strength of those communities and what as well and how, um, yeah, like those kinds of systems are set up to where also certifications are needing to be had. And that's something I don't know much about in the software world um, or the library, code library worlds. And um, yeah, I just thank you for pointing out that, that community network system. I, um, I'm gonna loop back around to sort of drawing the, the line on, you know, whatever that, where where that is right for you i mean for me <laughs> no ethical consumption under capitalism regardless right like we're sort of all in this space of um trying to make peace with the like violent system that we've all been handed in producing work like some aspect of um the tools we use the hardware we use uh including open source hardware and software um has like a violence to it right because we're existing in a system that does those things uh for me i think my line is often whether or not i am gifting power back to the corporation or individual that has made that tool, um, which is always a little fuzzy because there are also things that you do to survive, like as a person in the world. Um, I am on Twitter. Twitter is probably where I get most of my work. Uh, it is how I make connections with people and institutions. I don't believe necessarily in Twitter as a medium or a platform. Um, I, I don't think it's a good place, actually. I don't think they do a good job moderating their community. I don't think they do, a, I just don't think they're doing good in the world. Um, 
I used to make Twitter bots. This was a thing that I spent a lot of my time doing and I no longer do that um, because while I have control and agency over kind of what I say and do, I'm an entity on Twitter that can sort of disagree with their platform on their platform, right? Like I have some agency still in that space and I also don't necessarily have a choice. I mean, you ultimately have a choice, but it is my main sort of financial through line in the world. So it would be hard for me to leave that platform. Um, I don't necessarily need my art to live directly on that platform. That is granting that platform a certain power um, in the world over the work that I produce, but also like I'm giving it additional power. Like I'm saying like, this is a space that I believe in and I want my work to flourish and live on. And that's a very different thing. So I, I think there is for me and everybody will find sort of a different line on the tool. Um, there is a point where sometimes um, you have to use a thing to survive. And I won't shame people for that, like that we all live in this world um, and we have to eat. Uh, but sometimes what you're doing is actually giving value or giving power to that tool and um, or that corporation or that entity. And that is a, a thing that I think is worth sitting with and really thinking about whether you're comfortable and whether there is an alternative that might be not as good and that's better. Uh, and you can gain, give power to that and work on it getting to that place. And I am excited about that potential. It's like why I'm excited about all the tools that we all brought today. Once again, you all are awesome <laughs> in the segues. <laughs> I think the, uh, the making available, making the knowledge of these tools known is really um, uh, powerful. Um, right? Uh, again, they weren't always there when some of us went to school, but to know you have options, there is an alternative um, to also um, making rent. I think these are really um, important, powerful, and empower uh, us as creatives and artists to um, make decisions and participate differently in the ecosystem. So um, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we, we are wrapping up. I just want to um, give our deep uh, gratitude um, to uh, all of you uh, because um, this has been uh, not just informative, but um, really inspiring. So uh, deep, deep thanks to Everest, Aaron, and Shane for their generosity in sharing their knowledge, their commitment, and enthusiasm to open source arts. Um, this has been quite exciting to premiere COSA Connectors at ours Electronica Festival 2020. Um, so look, looking forward to future COSA Connectors with um, just sharing more of these open source tools and, and, uh, and <laughs> learning them. So I'm jumping on to all of the tools um, uh, because yeah, you, I have to say you, you all made amazing sales pitches. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in. So thank you again and uh, looking forward to tuning in next time.